This project is supported in part by a grant from the Alaska Humanities Forum and the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. This program is also sponsored by a generous donation from the Kenny Lake Bachelors Club. This documentary is also brought to you by Wells Fargo, a proud sponsor of Kenny Lake School. In 1898, a man and his wife, a woman of both size and zeal, were crossing the Valdez Glacier. His job was to pull a hand sled while his wife guided the trail ahead. Tired and worn out, the man collapsed. He turned to his wife and said, Mary, don't you wish we were back on the farm? No, I don't. It was Alaska. Alaska! If only you could get to Alaska, you would make your fortune. Now. Let's see you get out there and do it. Get out there and mush on. Sighing, the exhausted little man stood up and returned to the trail ahead. Their were avaricious dreams. Men of talent and virility were on their way to possibly sacrifice everything, including their lives among those mountains of solitude, and all for the alien god of gold. Men left the camp at all hours of the night, and many started with but one blanket and very little provisions, seeming to forget everything in their eagerness for gold. It was told of one man that when he heard of this find, he just grabbed two biscuits and ran. Another took with him but a single loaf of bread for a journey of 90 miles round trip. The reason I came to Alaska is that I had nothing to lose, and I'll be hanged, gentlemen, if I didn't lose that. It would be one of the greatest and strangest mass movements in U.S. history. In the winter of 1898, thousands of would-be prospectors from all across the United States and the world landed on a remote bay just off Prince William Sound for the adventure of a lifetime. They were drawn to this country by a media hoax and one of the most elusive forces in human history, hope. They were convinced they would find a relatively easy, all-American route to the Klondike gold fields, which proved to be anything but easy and anything but all-American. What they found was a wall of ice, the Valdez and Clutina glaciers, some 30 miles of icy crags and crevices that needed to be crossed, and 29 miles of an unruly Clutina river that needed to be navigated. And that was just the start. They discovered hardship, peril, and adventure. Everything, it seems, but the gold that beckoned them north. Their optimism would be tested, and most would leave disappointed, heartbroken, and financially ruined. Their only discovery perhaps being an understanding of how much adversity they could withstand. My name is Addison Powell, and for 10 years I lived in this country prospecting for gold and writing about the people and events of the Valdez Gold Rush. This is the story about the brave, 
oftentimes naive men and women who were drawn to this country in search of riches, but have faced the greatest challenges of their lives and changed this region and the lives of its native people forever. In 1898, gold fever drew men and women from across the United States and the world to the shores of Prince William Sound. Charles Margeson, a successful 44-year-old manufacturer of steam carousels in Hornsville, New York, who left his wife and three-year-old daughter. Horace Conger, a pharmacist from New York who sold this business quickly after learning about the Klondike Gold Rush. Leroy Townsend, a 27-year-old medical doctor from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, who deserted his practice for a chance to strike it rich, but would become an unsung hero. Luther Guiteau, a French chef from Freeport, Illinois, who would make one of the most harrowing and memorable trips down the Clutina River. Basil Austin, the 22-year-old English immigrant from Detroit who abandoned his job repairing and installing organs after only three years in the country. George Hazlett, a school teacher from Omaha, Nebraska. Anna Barrett, who was born in Sweden but moved to Alaska from St. Paul, Minnesota, became something of a saint herself. In the 1890s, Americans had spread out to the coast of California. Alaska was the last frontier to be explored. The territory had been purchased from the Russians in 1867, but it had been inhabited by Alaska natives for thousands of years. Many were skeptical of the Alaskan purchase, referring to the deal as Seward's Folly, in reference to President Andrew Johnson's Secretary of State William Seward, who negotiated the sale with the Russians. Seward was an advocate of manifest destiny. The idea that it was the duty of Americans to spread their version of civilization across North America. One newspaper said that the benefits of purchasing Russian America included a bracing climate, a promising ice crop, and cows that gave ice cream instead of milk. In the mid-1880s, the Indian Wars were just ending in the lower 48 and the U.S. Army wanted to determine the threat the native people in Alaska might present to the government. General Nelson A. Miles sent out Frederick Schwatka, William Abercrombie, and Henry Allen to explore the river systems of Alaska and determine whether the native people were hostile to the white men. Allen and Abercrombie would attempt to gain access into the Copper Basin by traveling up the Copper River. Abercrombie was the first to give it a shot. I was instructed to make my objective point the district of country drained by the Copper and Tanana rivers and ascertain as far as practical the numbers, character, and disposition of all Indians living in that section of country. After two months, Abercrombie concluded it was impossible to ascend the river, even though the local natives, the Atna, traveled from Nuchek to Tural, which is located across the Copper River from modern-day Chitna, in only 16 days. Uh, Lieutenant Abercrombie was young when he first came here and ambitious, and had been given a um, job of finding a route from coastal Alaska to the interior. And he came expecting to make his name in the Army, and spent the entire summer going aground, and never really getting anywhere up the Copper River. Um, failure, total failure of his mission. In September 1884, Abercrombie set out to ascend the ancient Atna trading route up Valdez Glacier. Then the fog moves in and they can't see anything and it gets rough going and um, Lieutenant Brombeck can't make it. And so Abercrombie goes on by himself. And he's extremely successful. He gets to the top he sees the lake on the other side, he comes back and he writes up this report that it's just a pass of 2,500 feet and uh, 15 miles to the interior. Obviously much, much better than any other route. Unfortunately, it was all fabricated. He saved his career, but um, he certainly made life miserable for the prospectors who later discovered it was a 4,500 foot pass and 45 miles, 
not 15. In 1885, General Miles sent the 26-year-old Lieutenant Henry Allen to see if he could succeed where Abercrombie failed. Allen departed New Czech on March 20, 1885, and, with the assistance of some native guides and Sergeant Katie Robertson, Private Fred Fickett, and a hired white prospector, Allen reached Toral in only 20 days. Botna Chief Nikolai pointed to the location of a vein of copper above Snowline. The Allen party went on to explore the Chitna, Copper, Tanana, Yukon, and Koyukuk rivers, a remarkable journey of more than 1,500 miles through some of the wildest country in America, all of which he mapped. Allen issued a warning that few miners in later years would take to heart. There may be, and probably is, great mineral wealth in the interior of Alaska, but as yet its location is unknown. From the nature of the country and shortness of the seasons, many years will be required to thoroughly ascertain the localities of valuable mineral veins. It is not my intention to discourage immigration to the territory, yet I would gladly warn all who contemplate it to regard with suspicion many of the current articles relative to the mineral well. From Chief Nikolai, Lieutenant Allen also learned of an old Atna trading route that extended from the Copper River Valley to Prince William Sound up the Clutina and over the Valdez Glacier. Allen's reports of an ancient Atna travel route and the erroneous report of Captain Abercrombie would lend credibility to the idea of a viable route over Valdez and Clutina glaciers to the interior of Alaska. Times were tough in America in the 1890s. Populism, labor unrest, and growing radicalism were taking hold in a land that had once seemed so full of promise. One persistent theme found its way into the American psyche. The United States had run out of space. Historian Frederick Jackson Turner announced in 1893 that the frontier experience in America was over. America in 1893 was in the grips of a panic nowadays known as an economic depression. Unemployment soared and thousands of workers wandered the streets and rode the rails looking for work. Many Americans lost faith in the American system. By 1897, Americans were ready for something, anything to restore hope in their lives. This hope would come from an unlikely source. In 1896, George Carmack stumbled upon one of the richest gold strikes in North American history on the Upper Yukon in a place that came to be known as the Klondike. In July 1897, the ships Excelsior and Portland arrived in San Francisco and Seattle, and miners shuffled down the gangplanks pulling sacks, blankets, and suitcases overflowing with gold. This sight fired up the imagination and hopes of thousands of Americans who on a moment's notice decided to push north at all costs. Charles Margeson described the energy in the streets of Seattle. The platform was crowded with people, and as we looked from our car windows, we were reminded of Circus Day in a small town. America was struck with gold fever. Now the question was how best to reach the gold fields. The quicker, the better. That left the would-be Stampeder with one of three choices. The regular route to the Klondike Goldfields was over Chilkoot Pass to Lake Bennett, where Stampeders built boats and journeyed 600 miles downriver to Dawson. However, the Canadians were right there at the top of Chilkoot Pass ready to tax the Stampeders and require each man to carry a year's worth of provisions which weighed between 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Americans, never fond of red tape or taxes for that matter, searched for a new route to the Klondike. They could have purchased seats on steamships and journeyed across the Gulf of Alaska. After passing through the Aleutian Islands and up the western Alaska coast, they could transfer onto a paddle wheel steamboat for a 1,700-mile trip up the Yukon River to Dawson. This was known as the Rich Man's Route and few of the desperate miners could afford the high cost. 
Because of the military expedition in the 1880s, many people chose to travel to Port Valdez by steamship. To succeed at this route, a man would have to move his outfit 46 miles over the Valdez and Clutina glaciers, build a boat and road across Clutina Lake, navigate his way through 25 miles of dangerous rapids, neither ascend the Copper River or follow the Millard Trail along the foot of Mount Drum to the mouth of the Solana River, then cross over Mentasta Pass and pull his boats up the Tanana and Yukon Rivers. I think it's a lot more difficult route, mostly because the Chilkoot and White Pass routes end in Lake Bennett. You build the boat, and it's 550 miles to Dawson. You know, it's just, it's all downhill. I mean, it was really just a pretty nice float. You get to the bottom of Clutina Glacier, you've got about 20 miles before you get to Clutina Lake. Once you get there, you've got, you know, 15 miles of lake, and then you've got 29 miles of white water to the copper, and then the river's flowing the wrong direction. You know, you're still 350 miles or something from Dawson once you get to the future site of Copper Center. Many more pragmatic prospectors realized that the whole of the Klondike would already be staked, and so they decided to follow the advice of the media and prospect in the Copper River region. It was said by many that the Copper Basin would be even richer than the gold fields of the Klondike. The Copper Basin was the spot, a spot that you could get to, you know, that was of the size and character to produce mineral riches. And it hadn't been examined by anybody. And they thought that they could repeat what happened in the Klondike, that they could come up here and they could make those discoveries. Most of them knew that they were too late to go to the Klondike. The Pacific Steam Whaling Company decided to promote this route to make some extra money. The company was hauling fish from the canneries in Alaska to the west coast, and they saw this media frenzy as an opportunity to make a few bucks. People up, fish down became the unofficial slogan of William Trellor, one of the men caught in the whaling company's transportation hoax. Some great corporations are long experienced in hoaxing the people. And the Pacific Steam Whaling Company advertised that country and put all the boats they could spare on the route from San Francisco to Port Valdez via Seattle on purpose to catch suckers or anything that would bite. The second class accommodations were crowded, not only with human beings, but also with horses, cattle, oxen, and a large number of dogs. People were forced to sleep on roughly hewn planks on straw mattresses while they subsisted on food that was more fitted for animals. The Valencia was better adapted for carrying cattle than human beings. The Pacific Steam Whaling Company of Seattle should be shown in their proper light in the East, with people cautioned to keep clear of them. It is a complete swindle. People pay $70 for what they term second-class passage. And when they're on the boat, they are treated like hogs. As the prospectors came closer to their unknown destination, some watched expectantly from the bow of the ship. They were looking for a town, for a sign of civilization. Their search was rewarded with snow and ice. Those coming up to go over the Valdez route, they expected to find a wharf, a bit of a town here, and were rather surprised as one of the prospectors wrote in his journal, if tying up to ice is tying up to a wharf, then indeed we did tie up to a wharf. Arriving at Valdez, we found no wharf, no storehouse, or any other convenience. Nothing in fact, but a snowbank. The ice proved to be useful since there was no dock. After the unloading of the ship began, as sleds and varied belongings were lowered down to the snow, it didn't take too long to haul goods about a mile and a half to a cottonwood grove. This grove is where the tent city, first known as Copper City, then Camp Valdez, later Port Valdez, and then simply Valdez, first came into existence. This unique camp, for it was about that, presented a scene of unusual activity. Some were tramping down the snow, preparing a place to set up their tents. 
Some were cutting poles and others cutting firewood, while others were getting their dog teams ready for hauling their goods up to the foot of the glacier, which was five miles away. Because of the short distance between the glacier and the camp, and because most people who came up looking for gold would come through Valdez, the town grew quickly. As the town kept expanding, little thought was given to the location for Valdez. The town was located in a major flood zone. Engineer Edward Gillette talked about the dangers of the Valdez town site. Where the town of Valdez has been hastily built, there is danger at any time of having the building swept into the bay by the swift and quickly changing channels formed by the numerous streams flowing from uncertain and ever-changing parts of the immense Valdez Glacier, situated some four miles north of the town. An occurrence of this nature would doubtless cause the loss of many lives. This is an awful country, nothing but snow and ice as far as the eye can see. These men had no idea what they were getting into, and most would not have known what to do if they had. Alaska was full of geographical obstacles such as powerful icy rivers, treacherous glaciers, swampy marshland, steep mountains, avalanches, and the occasional earthquake. The terrain was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Then there was, of course, the wildlife. One greenhorn prospector was found dead near the foot of a tree with the message clenched in his bloody fist. To folks at home, I have met my fate. Goodbye and may God care for and bless you all. Was hunting and wounded a bear. It has killed me. Goodbye. Though these newly dubbed prospectors were grown men, most lack the one important skill required in Alaska, knowledge of the land. Not everybody came to go over the glacier. Some came um, to what we would say it was to mine the miners. Despite the danger, the first citizens of Valdez were undaunted. Merchants made the trips up from Seattle to outfit a store. One group dug 10 feet down through the snow to reach ground. Trees were fallen and hewn and then carried to the store site. When the store was finished, they were rewarded with a flurry of customers. Their merchandise varied from lumber and tarps to tents and mattresses, some of which brought in a 300% profit. Entrepreneurs rushed back to Seattle to purchase more supplies. The first restaurant in Valdez was simple, but the men, who had lived on short rations during their journey from Seattle, were glad to have it. Only 10 men could fit in the restaurant, which was actually a tent, dug down into the snow about 15 feet. Boxes were used for the table and the chairs. The dishes were graniteware, and beans, bacon, baking powder, bread cooked, dried potatoes, and coffee was our bill of fare. We were glad to even get this bill of fare, for we had been on short rations on the boat for three or four days. Sour bread and salt horse. So this tasted pretty good to us. Eventually, Valdez grew so much that large companies like the Keystone Company and the Connecticut Company began to establish town sites. By March of 1898, the Valdez population was 600. By the end of March, it was somewhere between 1,200 to 1,500. This is going to be a boom camp, I tell you. Reports say that the Pacific Whaling Company now have 5,000 booked for this place, Valdez and it is estimated that anywhere from six to 40,000 will come in. Boats are coming in every few days. Some people picture the rugged Stampeder as ruthless, reckless, and untrustworthy. There were no laws, no courthouses, or jails in Valdez. Yet men were remarkably civil to one another along the trail, unlike the lawlessness of Soapy Smith's gang in Skagway. We had no law but a leaning tree and a rope, and needed no other. In order to transport hundreds of pounds of goods across 25 miles of Valdez and Clutina glaciers, across Clutina Lake, down the Clutina River and onto Copper Center, 
Miners had to cache their supplies along the trail. To a person coming here from a city like New York, the honestly displayed is perfectly astonishing. We go miles away from our goods and camp, and nothing is disturbed. One Sunday, when Slate Creek was abandoned by all hands because they were attending a miners' meeting in another gulch, I walked up the creek to find it deserted, and thousands of dollars in the yellow metal scattered around the tents in gold pans and tin cups. No one was left to watch over the treasure, as thieves in such localities are not protected by the law. The miners abided by a code that specified if a man stole something valued at $10, he would be banished. If he stole something valued at more than $100, he would be hung. Doc Tanner joined eight other miners who grub-staked him when he was broke. They made Tanner do all the dirty work. Tanner overheard three men conspiring to turn him out when supplies ran low. With winter approaching, a lone man was as good as dead. Tanner drew his pistol and walked into the tent and shot two of the men. The candle was extinguished and he missed the third man, who he wished to kill the most. Thinking he had killed all three, Tanner surrendered his revolver to W.S. Amy. The miners called a meeting and put Tanner on trial. The judge then called Tanner forward. What's your name? Well, Judge, I guess this here name of Tanner will serve me for the rest of my days. Which, from the looks of this crowd, seems to be very few. Do you mean to say that you killed those men without a reason or cause? They seem to think I should do all the dirty work. And I stood for it. But then I overheard their plans to chuck me out like a dog. And then some kind of buzzing gets in my head and I see red. I just swapped out my gun and let him have it. Was that all you have to say? Have you any folks or is there anything you wish to tell about yourself? No, I reckon not. I've been kicked from hell to breakfast ever since I was a kid. There are none to sit up at nights worrying about me. So if you fellows are gonna hang me, better go ahead and have it over. The court voted unanimously to hang Tanner. He was led to a leaning cottonwood tree and soon his feet were dangling. Newcomers saw that there was no room for crooks or criminals on the trail. You can only, on the glacier, you could only haul, you know, 150 or 200 pounds at a, at a load if you're uh, transporting 2,000 pounds, it's going to take you 10 loads to get over it. So you ended up traveling 400 miles before you ever got to the Copper Basin. I have now learned what it is to make an ass out of myself in earnest. Harness yourself up to a six-foot sled, put 200 pounds on it, and strike out for the foot of the glacier, which is five miles away. Repeat this twice a day for a week, and soon you'll have long ears. From Valdez, the men carried their supplies to the foot of the glacier four to five miles away to a place known as Glacier City. Here they would consolidate their gear and prepare for the difficult journey ahead. It was a challenging um, situation in which people um, adapted and learned to work together. The Stampeder's single most important piece of equipment was the Yukon sled. An average sled was seven feet long by 18 inches wide and cost six dollars a piece. The average load on a sled was about 150 pounds and included everything a miner might or might not need. Heavy tarpaulin tents, a sheet metal Yukon stove for cooking and warmth, a heavy sleeping bag, oil skins, extra boots, wool clothing, cooking utensils, axes, and a whipsaw for boat building. The food consisted of hardtack, beans, bacon, flour, rice, powdered eggs, potatoes, and dried fruit. An average prospector moved a load of about 1,500 pounds. By the time he reached Glutina Lake, each man averaged about 360 miles of hiking. I consider this a remarkable thing. When men are working so hard, as almost naturally to become very irritable when tired. And if anybody doubts that they were very tired, they could soon be cured of this after a day or two of actual work. The 
greatest danger of staying in Glacier City was runaway sleds. Charles Margeson was in Glacier City the day 600 Swedes arrived in Valdez. They immediately set up camp and started working their way up to the foot of the glacial bench. The first bench, stretching 150 feet at a 50 degree angle, proved to be too much for the rushed miners, and the sled broke away and crashed through several tents, injuring three miners. Other misfortunes would soon follow. The past few days have been eventful ones in the history of the camp. T.N. Opdahl of Munsonola, Minnesota, died upon the trail over the glacier of dysentery. A young man, 22 years of age, from Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, was shot by the accidental discharge of a gun in the hands of D. Worley, a young man, 18 years old, and of his party. It was a sad affair. The next morning at 10.30, Reverend R. conducted services, and the remains were laid in the cold, cold ground, where the snow is a winding sheet and the whistling winds a dirge. It was a sad sight to see a poor fellow pull down the glacier on a sled. He had pulled so many days and so hard, strapped to it just as he had strapped his load. Fifty men followed the body to the grave at the foot of the glacier. No coffin, nothing. Put his blanket to protect him from the cold, damp earth. Poor fellow came to this country to find his fortune, found his death. Once a miner started up the glacier, he would reach a particular spot referred to as the terminus, also known as the first and second glacial bench. This was the first obstacle which miners overcame by using a method known as block and tackle. At the top we drilled a hole in the ice into which was set a post, attaching to it a pulley through which we passed the end of a rope. Then attaching each end of the rope to a sled, about ten men would climb to the top get hold of the rope and empty the sled there, and come down the incline drawing the loaded sled up, carrying from six to eight hundred pounds of goods at a load. The first bench was so steep that miners had trouble walking up it. Some cut steps, but some saw opportunities to make money. One entrepreneur was a blacksmith, and he set about making ice cleats, which he then sold for about three fifty each. But I want to speak more of the trail. Like a huge snake, it winds northeast from Valdez to the glacier, and from morning until late night, weary packers slowly creep to the mountain of ice in the distance. A man's load averages 150 to 200 pounds. In crossing the glaciers, the difficulties increase. There is no wood for 30 to 55 miles. The inclination at some points of the trail is from 10 to 40 or 50 degrees. Five miles past the terminus was a point named Five Mile Camp. This was simply a short resting place for miners that completed the third bench. Many temporarily settled here to recuperate before heading on to 12 Mile Camp. From 5 Mile Camp to 12 Mile Camp and on to the summit is where most people began to despair and hallucinate. Some encountered what was known as the Glacier Demon. Stampeders who decided to quit did their best to salvage their reputation which meant lying about why they decided to head back. Some stampeders claimed they were going back to Seattle for supplies. One imaginative soul even said he was going back for cigarette papers. Little did they know, the miners who quit early were the lucky ones. On April 26th, at an elevation of 3,800 feet, some men endured a five-day storm exiting their tents only to relieve themselves and to shovel snow off the roofs of their tents. Any flammable items such as crates, stakes, and any other visible sources of wood were quickly burned for heat. One night, the great mass of snow, which had accumulated on the mountainside in the rear of the camp, at the foot of the summit, gave way and came crashing down the mountain. Nearly everyone was in bed, little dreaming of the danger in store when suddenly, with little warning, upward of 20 tents were buried under this great mass of snow from 6 to 14 feet deep. The miners grabbed shovels and rushed into the night. They rescued 25 of those buried in the slide, but B. Van Antwerp and Joseph Forner died of suffocation. 
One man named Johnson would later die from injuries caused by the slide. The two men who immediately died in the slide were buried near the foot of Poutina Glacier. Many miners lost their outfit in the slide and, discouraged and terrified, they headed back for Valdez and never looked back. Remarkably, Shorty Fisher's dog Jack dug himself out of the slide where he had been buried for eight days. Once they reached the top of the summit, spirits were lifted. Many men reflected on what lay ahead as God's country, the promised land and the Garden of Eden. I believe it was Joshua who had sent scouts ahead in to view the promised land. And I remember this picture that was in my old family Bible that had the scouts with a pole suspended between their shoulders and big grapes hanging from that pole. Well, as a kid, I always figured that the milk and honey must have been in their pockets because you certainly couldn't see it. We'd heard similar reports of timber camp down on the north side and the grapes were represented by spruce trees and the milk and honey perhaps by some real water from a creek and plenty of dry firewood. Many miners considered it all downhill from there, but the hazard still persisted. Avalanches and weather were no longer the big problems. Sleds were. Ascending the glacier, runaway sleds were a problem, and now descending they were too. Some miners, exhilarated by the climb, would attempt to sled down part of the glacier and would undoubtedly crash. It was estimated that one in eight people would freeze on the glacial trail, but other reports indicated that out of an estimated 3,500 crossing miners, only 50 would perish, hardly making the route deserving of the name the Death Trail of 98. Reports showed 52 deaths along the Valdez Glacier Trail, 17 died from freezing, and six from avalanches. All who survived the glacial trail thanked something for their safe passage, whether it be skill, luck, God, or for some men, whiskey. The drive to reach the gold fields made the men reckless with their animals. Horses, mules, donkeys, and dogs, all of which were used as pack animals over the glacier were worked to death and then eaten for the little nutrition they could provide. As many as 30 married women and two single women crossed the glacier during the spring of 1898, these women were admired for their pluck or courage while on the trail. In the male diaries, women were mentioned with either pity or complete admiration. Some just played out their role as housekeeper. They cooked, cleaned, and patched up clothes. Others would walk alongside their husbands pulling the sleds. Miss Dowling, a woman who held every man's admiration, she was also described as having a crack shot, and many birds and animals were brought down by her unerring aim. Margeson noted that she seemed greatly to enjoy the kind of life she was living. Another famous woman who overcame the trail was Lillian Moore, a smart Missouri girl who was adventurous and loved animals. Lillian Moore was somewhat younger. She was a horsewoman. And she was so good with horses that when Abercrombie finally showed up here and with horses because he decided one couldn't, army couldn't walk across the glacier when we had to go across the glacier on horseback. Well, this is the middle of the summer. This is August. The glacier is icy and slippery. And she helps him get the horses up the glacier. Not only was she the first woman to accompany the prospectors, she also staked her own claim and even found a little gold. But gold wasn't all that Alaska brought her. She met a man named Ed Wood, and they eventually got married. Together, they owned 45 horses and many various other animals, including two bears, which she raised from cubs. When she passed Glutina Lake, she was overtaken by its beauty. She decided to stay there. When I got to the head of the lake, it was as far as I wanted to go. Oh, it's a beautiful place, and it's called God's Country. Over there it never rains. The mountains are covered with flowers and berries. You never saw such large currants. Black and red raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, all kinds of fruit. 
the loveliest sweet peas and forget-me-nots. Oh, and talk about scenery. It was something grand. She started the first business on Clutina Lake. As the miners came back empty-handed, she would buy their now useless supplies and sell them. She also provided stables and a place to sleep. Because of her excellent location in the middle of the trail, business was brisk. She was also very concerned about the treatment of animals, particularly horses and dogs. The army, when they took Abercrombie, when they took their horses to the interior, the idea was, well, they'll just die over the winter. We don't have any food for them, and we're not going to take any food in. We'll just get next, horses next year if we need them. Um, she didn't like that attitude and did her best to save horses and get them brought back to Valdez and taken care of for the winter. One of my favorites was Anna Barrett. Even before she left, the local newspaper talking about the local people who were going to go on the great gold rush said she was out walking 20, 25 miles a day. You know, that tells you she, she was a person who really enjoyed being out of doors, enjoyed using her body. You know, she wasn't a, a sit at home type person. Anna Barrett operated a restaurant on Clutina Lake. She made and sold berry pies. Prospectors were so overcome by the taste of these homemade pies, they began to refer to Anna as a saint. The prospectors honored her by naming a creek on the northwestern side of Clutina Lake, St. Anne Creek. One of my favorite stories about Anna Barrett um, is the Thanksgiving. It was a wonderful event with a lot of singing, dancing, celebration, in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness on Clutina Lake. Because of their rarity, women were valued almost as much as gold on the trail, which sometimes resulted in trading. Addison Powell tells the story of one such transaction. I met old Chief Stickman, and he told me how he'd offered a bear skin, two marten skins, and a dog for a red-headed white woman he'd seen there the previous summer. Her husband had agreed to the trade, but when Chief brought out the articles, the white man looked at his wife for some time and then backed down. Poor stick man. He said that if he had only another bear skin, he could have procured the red-headed white woman he coveted. He had two wives already, but that Indian was ambitious. He wanted a variety in color as well as in numbers. At the time of the 1898 Valdez Gold Rush, most people still considered Alaska a frozen wasteland that held little social or economic value. But things began to change because of the gold rush. The military would later spend millions of dollars building the Trans-Alaska Military Road, popularly known as the Valdez Trail, which connected Valdez and Eagle. This trail evolved into the Richardson Trail and later the Richardson Highway, which established Valdez as the gateway to the interior. Valdez blossomed from a tent town nestled among the snowdrifts to a city built with modern houses, stores, electricity, a post office, telephones, a bank, a sawmill, and a telegraph system to link it to Fairbanks. Valdez would continue to prosper, but prosperity wouldn't save it from the decision to build the town in a floodplain. Valdez suffered considerably from the effects of the glacier flood that summer. A good portion of the town was washed away and I watched one house, furniture, mortgage and all, go floating out into the bay. Although the Great Alaska Earthquake of 1964 severely shook the town of Valdez, only the immediate waterfront was destroyed. 32 lives were lost on the dock. Residents continued to live in the town for three more years until the present town site was ready four miles away. Copper Center could trace its roots to the 1898 rush. It too would develop into an important town that would become home to the Atna, as well as settlers who came in on the heels of the Stampeders. Across the mountains near present-day McCarthy, USGS geologist Oscar Roan discovered pieces of copper float along the Kennecott River in 1899. 
and his reports caught the attention of prospectors Jack Smith and Clarence Warner, who discovered what looked like a green sheep pasture on a hillside near National Creek in 1900. This sheep pasture would turn out to contain some of the richest copper ore in North American history and brought in the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate, which developed the deposits from 1907 to 1938 and led to the construction of the Copper River and Northwestern Railway to move the ore to Cordova. The rush dramatically impacted the Atna and the Copper Basin. They were able to buy guns, food, tobacco, and clothing from the Stampeders. The Atna's subsistence lifestyle expanded to include the need for gunpowder, flour, tobacco, and other outside goods. The Atna quickly understood the value of firearms, and they found themselves suddenly part of the global economy. When you have all these extra people come in who are shooting animals, and there wasn't a lot of animals, but they shot the ones that they saw, uh, and that really affected the Atna. Uh, they weren't able to subsist in the way that they had, had subsisted previously. The mass migration and exodus of miners in 1898 took a toll on the Atna's hunting grounds. The careless miners started many forest fires that raged through Clutina Valley. By the winter of 1899, the Atna were starving and hit hard by tuberculosis and smallpox two diseases the miners brought with them that the Atna had no resistance to. You had disease come in, and disease virtually annihilated the population of Mentasta. Later, salmon canneries would use fish traps at the mouth of the Copper River with ruthless efficiency, which meant fewer salmon returned for the Atna to catch, making their existence even more perilous. The gold rushers did not have a sense of property rights in somebody else's territory, things they would never have done at home, they did here to the Atna. The Atna, a people who had survived peril and hardship in a forbidding land, were headed for a collision with the modern world. Some of the Atna quickly learned how to deal with this new type of economy. Doc Billum, an Atna shaman who lived near the mouth of the Tonsina River, ran a profitable ferry across the Copper River in 1901. Doc operated his ferry until the construction of the Northwestern Railway's trestle at Chitna rendered it obsolete. decided to run the Clutina River, it was a sobering experience indeed. The Clutina is icy, cold, and unforgiving. It is loaded with sleepers, rocks that hide just below the surface that can rip a boat in two, holes or troughs of water that can flip a boat, and sweepers that can pin those unfortunate enough to get knocked into the cold waters. At this point, the river descends in leaps and bounds over bars and boulders with a deafening roar that has anything but a pleasant sound for a man who must risk his life and his precious outfit on its treacherous waters. Men who had faced the storms of glaciers for weeks, living on cold victuals, overcoming obstacles that would discourage any but the most determined, with never a thought of turning back, weakened at the rapids. The first four miles of the lower Clutina were calm but swift. For the next 25 miles, it was a different story. The river runs at 10 to 14 miles an hour around boulders, sand and gravel bars, submerged trees and the occasional wrecked boat. Lut Guiteau and his party were ready to take their chances on the Clutina in June of 1898. Worked all day getting our boat ready for the big plunge through the rapids. And believe me, a lot of fool boatmen stood around watching us work and some of them asked questions that old Noah could not answer himself without consulting the Lord. 
It was a terrible, swift, and thrilling ride. When we pulled out from the shore at the head of the rapids, we could hear all kinds of remarks from the 20 or 30 folks who stood there to bid us goodbye. One fellow said, we'll never see those suckers again. We came near believing them an hour or so later when our big boat shot up on top of a huge boulder, quivering like a dying whale. But finally we raced onward again after being struck by a tremendous wave. The rapids were so intimidating that many miners gave up boating and decided to line their boats down the river. Five men held a rope attached to a boat and slowly advanced it down the rapids with one man in the boat steering. This proved equally difficult against the fast river and slippery rocks. Two Germans were working their outfit down. One walked on ahead to a point agreed upon where Louis, who had nerved himself to run the rapids, was to land. Everything went well with Louis until he attempted the landing. Here he struck a rock and upset. The German on the shore stood aghast for a moment, and then throwing up his hands, he cried out to his struggling partner in the water, Louis, Louis, you can have everything. I'm going home. I'm going home. And he immediately took the back trail. Louis, as though he had not heard all right, yelled back, Everything? Everything? And grabbing a box as it drifted, he worked his way to shore. It was the crucial test of our boat, and when I yelled back to Phil at the top of my voice, Are you there? And he replied, Yes, all but my hat. We both had to yell at the top of our voices as the roar was terrific every inch of the way. We had dodged boulder after boulder, and just before we hit the big one, but we could not avoid it, for we came upon it just immediately after shooting around a bend in the rapids that took our breath away, and in a flash, we hit it square on the nose, and in doing so, it undoubtedly saved us from being swamped. For if we had struck the boulder on the side of the boat instead of the center, the boat would have tipped and filled with water instantly, for we were going at a terrific speed. The Yatna collected the lost gear and placed it in piles alongside the river for the owners to find. In return, the Yatna would sometimes acquire vests, top hats, pocket watches, and different foods. For those that were brave enough to attempt the Clutina, and those that were skilled enough or lucky enough to succeed, the site of Copper Center, where it joins the Copper River, proved to be a sweet reward. In spite of all the predictions to the contrary, we shot the rapids successfully, and did so in three hours and 10 minutes. We were so completely exhausted when it was over, though, we had to throw a rope to the Indians on the bank and be hauled ashore. Copper Center was a turning point for many of the miners. Once they reached this point, the Stampeders needed to make a decision. Melvin Dempsey decided to stay in the Copper River country. Charles Margeson decided to abandon his search for gold and float down the Copper River. Basil Austin was one of the few to continue on to the Klondike. And then the prospectors came, and here they are expecting an easy 15 mile trip to the interior gold fields and finding a horrendous um, trip over the glacier, then no gold on the other side. They were expecting to pick up gold the size of goose eggs. How do you cope with disappointment like that? Um, how do you cope with knowing that other people have lied to you? Um, can any good come from it? For many disgruntled miners who discovered there weren't any gold nuggets the size of bird eggs covering the riverbanks, there was absolutely no reason for staying in Copper Center. They took one look at the town and decided they were going home. To get home, the prospectors either continued to float down the Copper River or turned around and went back the same way they came, over the Clutina and Valdez glaciers. Many sold their outfits for a song, and many who stuck it out found incredible deals. I went over to the banks of the Copper River today to an auction sale of two or three outfits of fellows who were discouraged and disgusted, going back to the States. 
I bought army rations at 11 cents a can and 10 pounds of evaporated onions for $2 and an iron kettle for 90 cents and it's big enough to make slum gullion for 20 people. Copper Center was started by a Norwegian named Andrew Holman. He began by setting up tents for a hotel, store, and an unofficial post office. He later replaced the tents with log structures. By August of 1898, there were three restaurants running full-time in Copper Center, some 200 miners living in their tents, and 100 small boats tied along the banks of the river. Some of the miners started to build log cabins for the winter. The Cuckoo's Nest was a cabin started by the Cuckoo's of Brooklyn, New York. Its name came from the fact that anyone who didn't leave the country was considered to be crazy or cuckoo. About 400 stampeders made the choice to dig in for the winter instead of returning to civilization. Copper Center served to take the edge off the adventure for many of the stampeders. Here they enjoyed a home-cooked meal, perhaps even a soft mattress, yet few suspected the subtle dangers ahead. Men started to notice bruises forming on their arms. Pain moved through their arms when they chopped wood. When they bit into a hard piece of bread, they saw blood on the remaining bit of food left in their hands. Soon they felt a sharp pain in their joints when they walked in the snow. It became apparent they had contracted scurvy. When scurvy attacks, it hits the bloodstream first. The entire body begins to look bruised. The heart beats faster and breathing comes in gasps. Legs soon become lame and joints start to ache. Flesh begins to lose elasticity and becomes soft, almost like bread dough. The face is puffy and yellow, while the eyes sink into the skull. The gums swell and bleed, and teeth drop out and litter the ground. Scurvy is caused by the lack of vitamin C, which is derived from fruits and vegetables. Fruit and vegetables were hard to come by for the miners. Ironically, many men carried lime juice and never knew they held the antidote to the disease that invaded their bodies. Snow whipped through Copper Center. Temperatures dropped. Nights became longer. Scurvy rode into Copper Center on the tailwinds of a winter that would not be forgotten. In 1898, there were 25 doctors who traveled the Valdez Trail, but their skills and competence were questionable. Some few quack doctors are located on the trail. If I had a sick dog and I wanted to get rid of him, I would. Otherwise, I would not. Dr. Townsend was not one of these. He knew scurvy and how to treat it. Luther Gateau and Charlie Collins started a hospital in Copper Center made especially for scurvy victims. It opened January 23rd. On January 31st, Dr. Townsend arrived in Copper Center. He immediately understood the seriousness of the situation. Dear sir, I beg to report to you here with the serious condition which prevails in the camp. Many are wholly without means and dependent upon others for nursing, medical attention, etc. We are in need too. Several men are suffering with frozen feet and amputations in a number of cases will no doubt be necessary. Townsend began to heal his patients with a special cure of potatoes, onions, and lime juice. With five remaining patients in the last days of winter, Townsend decided to take them to Valdez for better treatment. The party left April 17th. Townsend and his Indian guides made good progress until a short time after sawmill camp on the upper Clutina. He decided to leave his five patients with his hospital staff in a cabin while he and two Indian guides continued on to Valdez. A relief party soon came and rescued Townsend. When he set foot in Valdez, Townsend immediately started arrangements for rescuing the five sick men on the other side of the glacier. Dr. Townsend's battle to save Copper Center scurvy victims was perhaps the most heroic act seen on the trail of 1898, yet he received very little recognition from anyone.
To take the edge off the hard times, the men and women along the trail found relief in the simple things of life, whether it be a song, a book, or a good practical joke. I rolled the rock into the fire and left it there until it was too hot to spit on. Then with the aid of a stick of wood, I returned it to its original place. Immediately, he displayed unusual activity by yelling a war whoop, jumping over the log fire and crashing down the hill on the other side with a noise that resembled a stampede of cattle. There was always some charming music. Whether the music came from a guitar, banjo, mandolin, accordion, violin, or harp, it was cherished. A man by the name of Harry E. F. King of the Margeson Party was an all-time favorite. He played the piccolo, and everyone who heard him said he was a top-notch talent. Not all will agree that food is entertainment, but many men on the trail were entertained by food. A party of two, including Powell, after they had supped on snowballs and breakfasted on wind pudding and ice water, banged into the trading post half-starved after eating only one pheasant in the past 36 hours. After ordering the best the trading post had, they were presented with a pot of boiling meat. Dick exclaimed, Boys, I put 14 pounds of moose meat in that pot. After resting, the party of two dug in once again. They did this several times, soon finishing off that 14 pound piece of moose. Copper Joe and his brother enjoyed the delicacy of ice cream. When a crowd shouted that they wanted pie, their cook was startled. Pie, he exclaimed. He stuffed dried fruit between two pancakes and sewed the edges together with a piece of string and served it to the men. A doctor had picked up a porcupine along the trail and took it home as a pet. During the night, the porcupine crawled into his bed. The porcupine got defensive and to avoid being crushed, released some of his quills which stuck the doctor. Where did you see him do that? See when what do? The Indians. I confound you and your unwise brain. Do you imagine the Indians shot all these arrows into my butt? I tell you, it was that infernal porcupine! Beyond the music, food, and practical jokes, there were always stories, usually told around a campfire to help beat away the loneliness. Stories became the fabric that tied the miners together. There I was, all alone, confined to my cabin, and nothing to read. I read the labels on the baking powder cans, and I read the road to Wellville on the grapefruit packages, and uh, how glad I would have been to have uh, Shakespeare or Dickens with me. One day I wandered down the road to a deserted cabin, and there I found a treasure, a book. It was a book on fancy cooking, and there I sat, eating bacon and beans, reading about lobster a la Newburgh, pâté de foie gras, filet de boeuf, off champs. I read that book a dozen times and then took a took postgraduate course on banquets that I found in the back of the book. Banquets of 20 courses with different wines for each course. Gentlemen, that was not hardship. That was torture. Many of the men who came into this country were simply too preoccupied with the hardships they encountered to appreciate the beauty of the land around them. To most, Alaska was a cold and unfeeling prison, a cold, cruel land with sinister motives. 
but more cheerful and experienced men were able to look past the difficulties of surviving in Alaska to see the beauty that surrounded them. Say you sleephead, wake up and look at the grandest scene nature has ever painted. I have been staring at it for an hour. True, Alaska's hardships are severe, but she often repays one with what that filthy lucre cannot buy. Oh, ambidextrous Alaska, she affectionately strokes your brow with one hand and wrathfully cuffs you with the other. She woos you with a smile and drives you away with a frown. Compared to the tame beauty of cultivated gardens and domestic orchards back home, the mystery of the Alaskan region was a wild, surreal landscape that captured the imagination of many a hardened miner. Miners who stayed the winter were rewarded with beautiful displays of the aurora borealis, but even the very silence of the land was enough to astonish Basil Austin. Stopping in the woods, I found the silence absolute, even uncanny. There was not the slightest movement anywhere. The snow hung on the spruce trees, and not even a breath of the 45 degree below zero air was even moving. There was nothing. It was silence absolute as I held my breath. Then when I took my first footstep, the sound came crashing down just like a falling tree. Indeed. Alaska itself never ceased to be a wonder to the many men and women who had come to the north seeking material riches, but walked away with something less concrete, but much more memorable. We'll forget the cold December when the north winds played their tune, but if green veils we'll remember when twas all daylight in June, and we'll hearken to the calling of wildlife and pursue and the sounds of waters falling and broad leaves nod to you. At the time of the 1898 Valdez Gold Rush, most people still considered Alaska a frozen wasteland that held little social or economic value. But things began to change because of the Gold Rush. The military would later spend millions of dollars building the Trans-Alaska Military Road, popularly known as the Valdez Trail, which connected Valdez and Eagle. This trail evolved into the Richardson Trail and later the Richardson Highway which established Valdez as the gateway to the interior. Valdez blossomed from a tent town nestled among the snowdrifts to a city built with modern houses, stores, electricity, a post office, telephones, a bank, a sawmill, and a telegraph system to link it to Fairbanks. Valdez would continue to prosper, but prosperity wouldn't save it from the decision to build the town in a floodplain. Valdez suffered considerably from the effects of the glacier flood that summer. A good portion of the town was washed away, and I watched one house, furniture, mortgage and all, go floating out into the bay. Although the Great Alaska Earthquake of 1964 severely shook the town of Valdez, only the immediate waterfront was destroyed. 32 lives were lost on the dock. 
Residents continued to live in the town for three more years until the present town site was ready four miles away. Copper Center could trace its roots to the 1898 rush. It too would develop into an important town that would become home to the Atna as well as settlers who came in on the heels of the Stampeders. Across the mountains near present-day McCarthy, USGS geologist Oscar Roan discovered pieces of copper float along the Kennecott River in 1899, and his reports caught the attention of prospectors Jack Smith and Clarence Warner, who discovered what looked like a green sheep pasture on a hillside near National Creek in 1900. This sheep pasture would turn out to contain some of the richest copper ore in North American history and brought in the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate, which developed the deposits from 1907 to 1938, and led to the construction of the Copper River and Northwestern Railway to move the ore to Cordova. The rush dramatically impacted the Atna in the Copper Basin. They were able to buy guns, food, tobacco, and clothing from the Stampeders. The Atna's subsistence lifestyle expanded to include the need for gunpowder, flour, tobacco, and other outside goods. The Atna quickly understood the value of firearms, and they found themselves suddenly part of the global economy. When you have all these extra people come in who are shooting animals, and there wasn't a lot of animals, but they shot the ones that they saw, uh, and that really affected the Atna. Uh, they weren't able to subsist in the way that they had, had subsisted previously. The mass migration and exodus of miners in 1898 took a toll on the Atna's hunting grounds. The careless miners started many forest fires that raged through Clutina Valley. By the winter of 1899, the Atna were starving. You had disease come in, and disease virtually annihilated the population of Mentasta. Later, salmon canneries would use fish traps at the mouth of the Copper River with ruthless efficiency, which meant fewer salmon returned for the Atna to catch, making their existence even more perilous. The gold rushers did not have a sense of property rights in somebody else's territory, things they would never have done at home they did here to the Atna. The Atna, a people who had survived peril and hardship in a forbidding land, were headed for a collision with the modern world. Some of the Atna quickly learned how to deal with this new type of economy. Doc Billum, an Atna shaman who lived near the mouth of the Tonsina River, ran a profitable ferry across the Copper River in 1901. Doc operated his ferry until the construction of the Northwestern Railway's trestle at Chitna rendered it obsolete. The men and women who braved these mountains and rivers are all gone. Most achieved neither riches, fame, nor glory, but rather a treasure that proved more elusive throughout the years. They had an opportunity to discover buried sources of strength and perseverance and experience a life of bygone age, a life of nature's terms, free from the restraints of civilization. Leroy Townsend died on August 24, 1936, in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. He had fallen ill, probably suffering from a stroke. Horace Conger spent what was described as a hellish winter in 1898 in the Nebesna country. He traveled down the Yukon River in 1899, returned home, and never looked back. Captain Abercrombie died in Spokane, Washington in 1943. His attempts to name Lake Clutina as Lake Abercrombie and other key geographical features failed. George Hazlett went on to help establish the towns of Valdez and Cordova. He established the Hazlett Trail and he died in 1926 in Cordova. Basil Austin died in his home state of Connecticut in April of 1958 at the age of 84. 
Luther Guiteau built a cabin in Copper Center and remained in the territory for five years. Lillian Moore, the first woman to come to Valdez to prospect for gold, died suddenly in her home in Valdez from an apoplectic stroke. Anna Barrett was living in Valdez in 1900. Prospectors named St. Anne's Creek near Clutina Lake in her honor. Martin Bjornstad returned to Bremerton, Washington, where he worked as a house painter. He died in 1933. Charles Mardison returned home to New York and published Experiences of Gold Hunters in Alaska. He died in 1939. And if you read as many uh, accounts of the gold rush as I've read, I mean, not just the Copper Basin part, but the Klondike part, they're all written by people looking back on the high point of their life. I mean, they all saw it, the, even the failures saw it as, as a high point in their life. And, and so I think that that's an important thing. I think people need to realize that. Whether they found anything or not, you know, they, they were, blazing trails, some of the last trails to be blazed. Young men who went to Alaska desired to secure fortunes that their sweethearts might be ensured a home and comfort, to enjoy matrimonial bliss. Contentment constitutes happiness and not money. Away among the nooks of the hills and the forests it may be found. There where the vines lovingly entwine the cabin, where flowers display their smiles to the morning sunlight where the babbling brook murmurs love and the birds sing in the trees. If love dwells in the cabin, there also live the millionaires of happiness. The picture was indeed one of where, where beauty. Two miles below a village, 
It's like an Elmer Fudd. The picture was indeed one of rare beauty. Two miles below, <laughs> then I nodded. I was like, yes, got rare down. So if you guys are gonna hang me, better go ahead and have it over. I got it. There's a big old thing of grapes out anyway. <laughs> Sammy, you're dead. Stop moving. <laughs> there you go. Just, okay, set her down now. This is a dead body. <laughs> Sammy didn't <I> quite fit. <laughs> Nothing like an inconsiderate corpse, you know? <laughs> How many shots does <laughs> Neil, it only has six rounds in it.